All right, our state panel today, we are um, a minute early folks, but I was afraid in 60 seconds, we wouldn't be able to get to one more question. So we probably better just move on. Um, our state panel today is gonna to be facilitated by Zach Allen, the Workforce Policy Director at the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. You can see here on screen the order in which we're going to be listening to our panel members. We are just thrilled to have so many partnering state agencies be a part of today's panel. We're gonna hear about half of these presentations, three from three different agencies, followed by a question and answer time. Then we'll take a short break, and the second set of state panel members will speak, also followed by questions. And all of this is gonna be facilitated by Zach. Please use the chat box and send questions into Zach. Start your question by indicating the name or agency to whom you're directing the question towards. So Zach knows that this question is for, uh, for example, this question is for Jason at Illinois State Board of Education. Um, once we get through both sets, of state panel presentations and Q&A, you're gonna be more than ready for lunch, right? Um, one other comment, uh, we haven't typically called out who's asking the question. Sometimes people want it to be known and sometimes people wanna ask a question without um, having their, uh, their name or their institution um, announced. If you want it specified that this is a question you're asking, maybe somehow indicate in the chat box, please, uh, please share this question is coming from me. Otherwise, we'll try to kind of be neutral. We kind of did that last year to where we weren't really um, indicating who had asked the question as much as anyone uh, can put the questions in the chat box and we'll be happy um, to facilitate that question on with the state panel. I have had the pleasure of working on so many different projects with Zach at the governor's office and I love his sense of humor and his very thoughtful comments. Thank you for agreeing to facilitate the state panel today, Zach. I am passing the baton to you. All right, I think I've caught it, Joni. Um, <laughs> I'm, so, I, I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, we, we really just have a, a, a lot of experts in, in the room today. And I, I, can, I can really attest to that because I've had the opportunity to really partner with, with all of them through um, a couple of my different roles, um, you know, in, in the field. It's it just really, really an engaging panel today and uh, really, really looking forward to it. We're going to uh, kick, kick it off uh, this morning with Dr. Stephanie Bernatite. Uh, she is with the Illinois Board of Higher Education and she serves as the executive uh, deputy director there. So really excited to hear from Stephanie this morning and please remember to send me any questions you have in the chat. Stephanie? Thank you so much, Zach. Um, how's the audio? Can I get a thumbs up from you if that's okay? Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone um, at the Gateways Higher Education Forum. This is one of my favorite conferences every year because I know um, were we all together in a room, that room would be filled with just straight up awesomeness. So I am so happy to, to get to connect with all of you today for just a bit and to share some work that's happening um, through the IBHE and in partnership with all of our education agencies, the Community College Board, the State Board of Education, Education, ISAC, the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, um, as a backdrop and supportive frame for your work at your institutions. Um, I want to take you to what likely has become somewhat of a recurring theme um, over the past couple of years when I've had the opportunity to connect with you in various meetings. I talked with you about the development of our higher education strategic plan. And so many of you participated in that process in very critically important ways. That plan was formally adopted by the Board of Higher Education in June of 2021, so just about 10 months ago. And we call that plan a thriving Illinois. It was subsequently ratified by both the Community College Board and the Illinois Assistance, Student Assistance Commission. Um, when I think about what this plan is about, it is really fully um, encapsulated in the comment on this slide. When we are seeking to build a thriving Illinois, we are thinking about an Illinois that has an inclusive economy, broad prosperity, and equitable paths to opportunity for all, especially those facing the greatest barriers. 
This plan is comprised, as you may likely recall, of three primary goals and a set of 25 strategies accompanying them. We have set goals as part of a thriving Illinois to close the equity gaps for students who have been left behind, to build a stronger financial future for individuals and institutions, and to increase talent to drive economic growth. I want to highlight for you a little bit about the work that's underway related to each of these goals. We're going to start with the equity goal and um, spend just a little bit of time connecting to the wonderful comments by Dr. Pierce from Heartland Community College. Um, when I think about um, his work as an academic leader, a higher education leader in Illinois, and some of the exciting possibilities he sees for uh, taking the work that you all are doing day in and day out um, to promote both access and opportunity for working adults and other underserved individuals. Um, it just really, I think, is thrilling. One of the key strategies in the equity goal section of a thriving Illinois is specifically focused on working adults. And if you were to open up that plan, as I do pretty regularly in, in my day-to-day -day job, you would see some descriptions that include the features you see listed here on this slide. That there is critical work underway being led by you and so many colleagues around the state to intentionally re-engage adults. Um, this work has always been important, but really in many ways in our time, never more so than during what we have experienced together albeit in different ways through the pandemic. The pandemic has really accelerated projections for needs for individuals to upskill or perhaps reskill entirely and to interact with higher education to do that in order to have the kinds of working opportunities that would sustain themselves and their families. When we think about this uh, working adult strategy, I also see so so many connections, again, to the work you have been doing over many years now with support from funding through the Governor's Office for Early Childhood Development, um, the Preschool Development Birth Through Five grants, supports from private philanthropy through the Robert R. McCormick Foundation, strategies to really think about how to create personalized paths to completion through competency-based education, your efforts to create resources for um, to support curriculum and an assessment that, again, helps individuals build on what they know and progress toward expected competencies and credentials in our field. So I just want to connect very specifically here that there are call outs in the higher education strategic plan that align very strongly and supportively to the work that you've been doing and work that is underway right now through, among other things, early childhood credential completion cohort grants. I also want to spend some time sharing with you some other wraparound state initiatives under the umbrella of the strategic plan that I think connect to things that you are working with directly on your campuses or that your colleagues at your campuses are engaged in. In the equity goal area, we know that the comprehensive and very profound impact of the pandemic is and has affected learners from early childhood settings through college. And we need to specifically enact strategies to support their learning and learning renewal. So while this is very broad area, I want to highlight two key initiatives that are underway. The first is the allocation of governor's emergency education relief funds to institutions of higher education. These resources are specifically dedicated to colleges and universities, public primarily, but with some resources set aside for some private institutions as well to build out resources on their campuses for students who have been most impacted by the pandemic and are at risk for not beginning their higher 
ed journey or continuing and completing their higher ed journey. So if you have seen an expansion on your campuses of laptop loaner programs or access to Wi-Fi and MiFi uh, resources for students who are working in areas where they don't have reliable access to the internet, if you've had an expansion of telehealth or counseling services on your campus, perhaps expanded resources for and hours for food pantries or emergency grants for students. It is likely some or all of that work has been funded through these governor's emergency education relief funds. We know that institutions have also done substantial private fundraising and been creative about leveraging existing resources to make these kinds of supports possible. We also have been in partnership with the State Board of Education engaged in work to create and launch the Illinois Tutoring Initiative, which is a statewide project designed to link institutions of higher education to school districts and provide targeted high-impact tutoring services to students in districts of greatest need. This work involves six institutions, Governor State University, Northern Illinois University, Illinois State University, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and Carbondale, as well as Illinois Central College and Southeastern Illinois College as partners in this work. And the intent here again is to provide opportunities for college students and other stakeholders to serve as trained tutors for students in our K-12 schools in support of their learning renewal. I also want to update you that um, as part of our equity goal, we have outlined a strategy that will involve working with public institutions and private institutions to develop equity plans to close gaps in enrollment per assistance and completion. This section of the Higher Education Strategic Plan calls on institutions to use campus climate surveys, equity impact analysis tools, professional development strategies, data and predictive analytics, and in thorough review of existing policies and practices and potential revision of those where they are identified to exacerbate equity gaps. This strategy is provisioned in a bill currently in front of the legislature, House Bill 5464. That bill has passed the Senate and is in front of the House as amended, passed by the House Higher Education Committee yesterday. So that omnibus bill includes other provisions for student protections, consumer protections, but specifically calls on institutions to develop equity plans. And we're really excited about next steps on that work as the legislature continues its convening and work this session. The equity goal section of the strategic plan also specifically calls on strategies to increase and retain faculty, staff, and administrators of color. Um, this long-standing program called Diversifying Faculty in Illinois is an IBHE initiative for which we are seeking about half a million dollars of additional funding this year. If that moves through the budgetary process in the legislature, that will allow us to expand fellowships for interested persons of color, underrepresented groups, um, individuals for underrepresented groups to pursue a goal to complete graduation and become both faculty and faculty leaders in higher education in Illinois. We are really excited about this initiative because we know, as do you, that making sure students interact with faculty and staff who look like them and who can have, in, in many cases, shared experiences is a critical part of supporting student success. The next section of the strategic plan is on building a stronger financial future, and we'll move forward to a strategy that is underway currently with Illinois. Earlier this year, I'm sorry, late last fall, excuse me, time is getting away from me, um, the Board of Higher Education launched a Commission on Equitable Public University Funding. This commission is a statutory charge and provides a really important landmark opportunity to examine how public higher education in Illinois is funded. Full details about this commission and its open meetings are available on our website. You'll see this commission is being led by Senate Majority Leader Kimberly Lightfoot, Lightford, Representative Carol Ammons, the IBHE Board Chair John Atkinson, and 
Deputy Governor for Education, Martin Torres. Equity is a central component of this funding commission's work, and we anticipate completing that work by July of 2023. The final strategy area in the higher education plan supporting your work is all about growing talent, central to your day-to-day -day efforts. Uh, one of the things we want to share with you is a tool that is available to students, prospective students, individuals in Illinois interested in learning more about post-secondary education, school counselors, supporters of students who are navigating their way through higher education. I'm going to ask Julie to play a short video about the Illinois Post-Secondary Profiles tool for you now. The school, community college, or university you attend shapes your relationships, career, and future. You want your school to excite you, to support you if you're struggling, and to have a community of like-minded students. Put simply, the school you choose had better be the right one. No pressure, right? College search tools can make you feel like you're well-informed, but a lot of things often create a blurry picture. Search results can give simplistic and sometimes even misleading results, leading you to question your ambitions. And the data used to build these tools? Well, they can lack key information. Worst of all, none of them properly factor diversity and equity into their design. Students in Illinois deserve a better tool for shaping their futures. And now they have one. It's called IPP, Illinois Post-Secondary Profiles. IPP is different. It's built for diverse users with diverse goals. It all starts with the data. IPP collects the most comprehensive data directly from Illinois higher education state agencies and institutions. But raw data isn't enough. You need to be able to search, filter, and navigate through the sea of information to find what's relevant to you. That's why we've created a few key ways to explore. These three profiles are sorted by institution, occupation, and equity, and designed to deliver exactly the kind of information for choosing the right school. Institutional profiles lets you discover the basics. What types of schools are out there? How much they cost? And what credentials they offer? This information is sorted in a clean, readable design that works across any device. Occupational profiles go a step further. They let you see what academic majors are available, key employment data for hundreds of potential occupations and pathways leading to the kinds of careers you're interested in. Finally, there's equity profiles. These let you see the kinds of people who have enrolled and who have completed credentials at schools, colleges, and universities across Illinois. You could search by age, by race and ethnicity, and can even search by gender beyond the binary. These three profiles work together to create a holistic, nuanced lens for every Illinois-based school. It gives students the ability to look beyond the bullet points and dig deep into metrics that matter and the tool can benefit other people who impact student success, high school officials, higher education staff, employers, policymakers, and regional collaboratives. A rich tapestry of data, search terms, maps, pathways, career clusters, profiles, and more make IPP the best college research tool. IPP knows Illinois, it knows its people, and it knows how to guide students to the school of their dreams. Get started with IPP today and shape the future that you want to build. Go ahead and jump to the next slide. That post-secondary profiles tool is informed by data provided by the Community College Board and the Board of Higher Education and all of your institutions. So um, we're really excited about sharing that work with you and others around the state. As we look at growth, another strategy is encouraging high school students to stay in Illinois. Um, earlier uh, last year, we launched a statewide effort to have all public universities participate in the common application or the common app as a way for students to seamlessly apply to all public universities and many independent institutions that are part of the common app in Illinois all at one time. Although these data that you see on this slide 
started are a bit old as of the end or latter part of February. You'll see that we've seen a marked uptick in applications from among students in Illinois and across the country. Now, granted, these data are a little bit skewed by the fact that uh, previously we only had a couple of institutions public that were part of the Common App, some of them for a number of years. But nevertheless, we are seeing a really important uptick in high school students seeking their opportunities here in Illinois and look forward to sharing more. I also want to highlight for you um, relative to Rick's comments and work ongoing with so many of you around the state uh, that we have been selected as a state to participate with two other states in the country, all considered leaders in the area of transfer in a pilot initiative that we're calling Transfer Boost. Bachelor's opportunities, options that are straightforward and transparent. The Transfer Boost initiative in Illinois, we are joined by Arizona and Virginia in well, as well, is a partnership from among these state agencies and then several national higher education partners. And it's all about creating a transfer affordability guarantee. We have several institutions that are participating in this project, Chicago State University with Olive Harvey College and South Suburban College, Governor's State University with South Suburban and Moraine Valley Community College, and Southern Illinois University Carbondale with John A. Logan, Shawnee Community College, and Moraine Valley Community College. This Transfer Boost initiative includes some enhancements to transfer pathways in that students will know from day one as they enter a community college what their defined pathway is in identified programs. In addition to full transfer of their credits, they will have a clear fixed cost about how much it will cost them both in terms of time and resources to complete their bachelor's degree as part of the transfer boost path. And we look forward to sharing a lot more with you about that work as we as we move through these early launch phases. Finally, to wrap up, um, we are engaged, as all of you know, in work to launch a consortium of institutions. That work is well underway thanks to you and your colleagues across your campuses. It is supported by multiple agencies, and I know we'll be covering more about this later in the forum, so I won't dovetail that here except to let you know that this has specific placement in the plan of Thriving Illinois. Finally, as we continue to think about growing talent, we are positioning the Board of Higher Education to conduct a regular supply and demand analysis, and that work aligns very closely to work in the field of early care and education to make sure that programs are available as and how and where students need them. This will cross multiple industries and multiple regions and will be ongoing work as we move forward. With that, knowing time is short, I'll end my remarks and conclude by saying that I appreciate so much the opportunity to be with you and wanted you to have a sense of some of the wraparound pieces that are happening under the umbrella of the strategic plan as they connect to the work that you're doing at your campuses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you so much for that uh, in engaging information. It's always uh, an absolute, uh, absolute pleasure. Ne next uh, with our panelists is uh, Dr. Jason Helfer. I'm really excited to inter introduce Jason. He is with the Illinois State Board of Education and uh, he serves as the Deputy Officer for Instructional Education at ISBE. Uh, Dr. Helfer, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Zach. Like Stephanie, I'm very honored and feel very privileged to be here again to share some updates from the Illinois State Board of Education. And one of the things I enjoy most about this forum is getting to hear from my colleagues in different state agencies. We work on lots of projects together, to be sure, but to hear things, kind of the summaries and updates of where things uh, are in, at a particular time is uh, always a, a good thing to know. And I always enjoy uh, learning more about the great work that my students state agency colleagues are doing. So today's update will focus on really the, the very small but essential sliver of work that the state board does in early childhood in terms of licensure uh, and share some programs, many of uh, these programs that we introduced and I'll try to share some additional information about them as well. So we'll talk, <clears throat> talk about some licensure flexibilities. We'll talk about the Illinois Educator Preparation Profiles and some of the work that it, uh, the Illinois State Board of Education is doing with teacher recruitment and teacher retention. 
So one of the things that we're doing in terms of licensure flexibilities is that the, the Associates of Applied Science can be used toward early childhood education requirements. And one of the ways that this was memorialized was through Public Act 102-174. So there is very clear articulation that a candidate or a student is aware of the work that they do in their Associate of Applied Science degree will transfer uh, into an early childhood program at an institution that would grant the endorsement. And one of the things that we've done for the teacher preparation program, so the four-year programs is that the change request, we want to know how you're aligning the uh, doing this work. Now, instead of needing to go before our licensure board, which can, uh, as a former department chair of a department of educator preparation, I know that having to go before the licensure board sometimes took a lot of time and resources. So now, instead of that, the program change form is sent to our staff in educator effectiveness. They look at it. If there's questions, they ask them, and then the program moves forward. Probably in the last three years, the, the most important changes, or I should say awareness, is that we've tried to develop in faculty across the pre-K all the way through the, you know, the, the teaching in high school endorsement areas, is that it has always been the case in our rules and parts. 25, at least as far back that I can remember, you know, to 2002, 2003, that an institution of higher education with an approved preparation program can honor prior learning assessments or other alternative means uh, in place of coursework. Now, as Rick said earlier, that can be intimidating, it can be daunting, it can be confusing. Because what constitutes the sorts of things that are often um, checked off or verified through coursework and fieldwork experiences when somebody brings in, for instance, 15 years of serving as a paraprofessional in an early childhood classroom. So what that means at the institutional level, I wish I could give you an exact sort of picture of that. But working with some uh, institutions, that's been very different. In some places, this idea has resonated deeply and work has moved forward at a, at a fairly good pace. In others, there's a little bit more insecurity, wondering about HLC requirements, what might this do if we looked at these things in a particular way, and a faculty not maybe being familiar with these sorts of approaches. So experiences in teaching, different certifications, content, knowledge, assessments, all of those things as determined by the institution, because I do understand, as again, sitting in receipt a number of years ago, that you're the one that, as it were, presses the button on endorsement saying, we believe this person is ready to be the teacher of record in an early childhood classroom. So one of the things that, that this does, and again, building off of what many of the points that Rick and Stephanie brought up, is that it can shorten licensure timeline. It can honor the experiences of a candidate, which, quite frankly, in my experience, that often leads to higher retention rates. When you are able to acknowledge and honor the assets that somebody brings into a program, that's really, really important. Uh, it can, of course, lower education costs uh, because maybe some coursework or some field experiences are not uh, necessary. As I said, increased persistence in programs, and there is a form that an institution can use to verify those individualized pathways to, to licensure. And then I believe if you receive this as a PDF, you'll be able to click on that bottom, resources and considerations to see, well, some resources and considerations. So is the, because of the pandemic, <clears throat> as well as just hearing from folks, you know, faculty at different institutions thought through short-term approvals. And so there's a couple of them. There's the short-term emergency uh, early special education approval. And this was developed specifically to aid in hiring flexibility in this high need area. And the other, the short-term approval, allows somebody who does not hold a Pell, but holds a bachelor's degree in a particular area, to receive a temporary, as it were, so a short three-year approval for them to teach in that content area. And that is something that is maybe more prevalent in content areas like mathematics, chemistry, English, and so forth, those things that would be at the middle school and high school level, where somebody who has a bachelor's degree in one of those areas, who maybe has now a sense of calling to become a teacher for whatever reason, this is one way to get them started teaching and then for them to finish up the other requirements that we require in Illinois. Subsequent endorsements on a license, any license uh, that we, we offer, so the early childhood, elementary, middle level, K-12 endorsement or high school endorsement, we moved from um, 24 credit hours plus the content test to 18. And that was actually something that was initiated by faculty in higher education institutions. And then finally, on account of the pandemic, we heard from districts the dearth of paraprofessionals and then doing something about a short-term approval to increase those numbers. And so that was something we responded to with requirements for short-term approval for that license, a paraprofessional license. All right, so the IEPP, in uh, distinction to what Stephanie introduced, the Illinois Educator Preparation Profiles, the first bullet point is not true anymore. It was not released on April 
first 2022, unfortunately, there was a data issue that we are working out through. And we, I believe yesterday actually sent something out to institutions. As we have more information about that, we will share it with you. And one of the biggest changes this year from last year was from the early childhood community saying, wait a minute, lots of our candidates don't go into district programs. They are teaching in community-based programs, other places and so forth. And so we were able to receive data from the Illinois Department of Employment and we can make the data of the Illinois Educator Preparation Profiles more accurate in the early childhood area because some faculty were rightfully concerned saying we graduate n number of candidates, 50% of those go into public schools, but the other 50% don't. And all of a sudden, we, it doesn't look like we're doing what we're supposed to do or our program doesn't look su successful. All really legitimate and important things that we want to make sure that an accountability system is as accurate as possible. So thank you for your advocacy on that particular point. Okay, on teacher recruitment, you can go ahead. So as Stephanie introduced, the, the Early Childhood Access Consortium for uh, Equity Scholarship program, ISB, the Board of Higher Ed, Community College Board working very, very diligently on what this program is supposed to look like and how it is being rolled out and all of those sorts of things. So that's very exciting for us that we have a very dedicated, very deliberate sort of opportunity to work with our sister agencies, higher education, and other advocates for early childhood to make sure that we're thinking about the workforce issues correctly. And so one of the things that is both a blessing and maybe sometimes a curse of working at the state agency is uh, even as the way I you know, opened up my uh, our comments today, really small slice of something. And so we focus in on that small slice so much that sometimes, what is it the, the saying? We lose the forest through the trees and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that uh, we are serving our future teachers that will serve our earliest learners well, that we're thoughtful about how to support them going about obtaining a, a license in early childhood. There are, from the PDG B5, the Education Reimbursement Initiative, I believe we have six different institutions, and Stephanie might have mentioned those, where we have individuals that are receiving some support as they continue to go through a cohort or program. We update our board on that about every couple times a year, and it seems to be moving in the right direction. So very, uh, what we've learned in the last number of months, we, we do really need to put scare quotes around grow your own. So we do have teacher residency sorts of grants. Um, they're not the same type of program as grow your own in, uh, in Illinois. There is an organization that focuses on that work, but rather it is a way of helping districts, institutions of higher education, thinking about an educator career pathway program. So again, connecting back to what Rick was saying. So this year in particular, we were giving priority to those districts that were working in rural or low income schools. And the good news about it is that thus far, over a thousand high school students have initiated this career pathway. That is, they want to, they're interested at this point in becoming teacher and that, teachers. And that's really exciting, especially because, at least in my daily work, I hear multiple times a day about issues of teacher recruitment and retention. So in terms of teacher retention, there's all sorts of, you know, not all sorts, but, but four different ways that we're really focusing on that. The first is the new teacher coaching and mentoring. This started using some of the ESSER dollars and our IFT, IEA, and the Chicago Teachers Union have matched over 700 pairs of first and second year teachers with mentors to support them. And the, that work is about four uh, with 40 districts throughout the, the, the state. The uh, National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, so some of our teachers, the way that they want to work on developing their craft is undergoing that experience of, of obtaining National Board certification. And so far, uh, since the program's inception, uh, we have about 6,800 active teachers and 153 teachers received the certification in December of 2021. And if you're thinking to yourself, 151 of the 130,000 doesn't seem like a lot of teachers. I just want to, to make a quick mention that the way that National Board Certification works is a little bit different than it had in years past. So that has decreased the numbers, but it has increased support and entry points in order to obtain that certification. We are working with the Regional Comprehensive Center. So I, I apologize for putting an acronym up there that I didn't spell out. RC9 is one of, I believe it is 12 different comprehensive centers across the nation that typically work with two states. So Illinois is in this with, with Iowa, and it is a grant that an organization gets through the Department of Education, and then their work is with the states. And so one of the projects we're doing with RC9 has to do with teacher retention and recruitment, thinking about strategies beyond the, and I, again, don't want to sound um, flippant here because I don't mean it this way, but the billboard or the quick video of saying, hey, do you want to be a teacher? 
picture because what other states have found and what, is, what we found too is that really doesn't make that much of a difference. And states have spent, not Illinois, but other states like Michigan, Louisiana, and so forth, have spent tens of millions of dollars on this. And really that's not what the, 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 the issue is. I mean, there are, as we all know, issues of media portrayal of teachers and, and public schools in particular that probably get in the way of somebody's wanting to jump in the, you know, jump in the pool sort of thing. There are issues of pay, working conditions, especially during the pandemic. Our teachers are the superheroes of the universe, as far as I'm concerned, for the work that they've done over the last two years, virtually. One of the things I still can't fathom is how a child who started kindergarten two years ago, so they'd be a, um, rising, two rising second graders. What did that look like when you first met your teacher through a Zoom call or a Zoom meeting? I, they're miracle workers, so really deep appreciation for them. Again, the work with RC9, focusing in on how to hone in on what are those retention strategies that could work. One of them that we believe to be right and true has to do with affinity groups. So we have entered into an intergovernmental agreement with one of our local regional offices of education to focus in on affinity groups for, uh, in particular, for diverse teachers. And we've been asked by our board, why not all teachers? And one of the things that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the uh, evolving research in this area is that oftentimes teachers of color need a safe space where they can talk with other teachers of color and other administrators of, of color in order to work through all of the challenges, all of the pressures that are placed upon them and the like in, in terms of their daily work. So uh, that intergovernmental agreement was just executed and we are looking forward to sharing with our board in about nine months or so the first sort of fruits from that work. As I do every year, there's my phone number and email. If you have questions, please email me directly. I'm pretty good about getting back to people in about 24 to 48 hours. Happy to help you in any way that I can. And just want to end with a comment of thank you for all of your good work supporting our teacher candidates. And again, pleasure to, to speak with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Helpler. What, what great work that's being done at ISB. Thanks so much for sharing that with us today. And uh, I have to attest, he, he is really good about uh, being responsive and answering his emails. So send him those questions for sure, for sure. So thanks again. Next next uh, on the agenda for our uh, panelist is Bethany Patton. Bethany is from the Illinois Department of Human Services, and she serves as the Associate Director of the Office of Early Childhood. So we are really glad to have Bethany here today. Thanks so much, Zach. And it's good to be with all of you here this morning. My hope for the next several minutes is that my spring allergies don't get too in the way of our time together, um, but I'm looking forward to diving in. So you can go on to the next slide and why don't we go ahead and get started. I would like to spend my you know, time here with you all this morning, first talking a little bit about DHS's newest division, the sixth division within the department, which is the Division of Early Childhood. And then I want to talk just briefly and mostly at a high level about some of the work that we've been doing with our federal relief funds in partnership with each of the other folks on this panel here this morning. So I will start with a bit of an overview of the Division of Early Childhood. You can see our brand new logo here off on the right. Um, back in 2021, about this time last year, Governor Pritzker announced the creation of the Division of Early Childhood. This is, as I said, the sixth division within DHS. And the purpose here around creating a division focused entirely on early childhood was so that the department could better strengthen and unify and provide greater support for the very various early childhood programs within DHS. And this includes our child care program and our quality improvement grants that accompany that child care assistance program, DHS home visiting, which includes the maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting program, as well as DHS funded home visiting and early intervention services within DHS. I'll talk a little bit more about each of those on the next slide. So as I mentioned, DEC, its purpose is to better strengthen and unify early childhood in DHS. Prior to the creation of the division, early childhood lived within the Division of Family and Community Services, and we now have our very own division director. Director Chernowski joined us in October of last year as the new division director, and our goal here is to create greater capacity within the department so that each of the different programs that you see on this screen aren't solely focused on 
meeting our state and federal regulations, but also have the support and the capacity that they need to work together with one another, to think about how we use these programs to serve the whole child and the whole family, and to better connect with other early childhood and human services, not only in DHS, but also within the State Board of Education, within the Department of Children and Family Services, and at the regional and the local level as well. I mentioned childcare already, which includes our quality grants, our child care assistance program, and Migrant and Seasonal Head Start, where we are you know, providing funds direct to delegates and grantees at the local level. I mentioned early intervention, our Part C funds for infants and toddlers ages zero to three. And I mentioned home visiting services for that same age group as well. Part of the creation of the division also included the creation of a new bureau focused entirely on collaboration and partnership. And so this is where we are housing our Head Start State Collaboration Office, our All Our Kids Network, our work on mental health consultation for infants and toddlers, which was spread across each of the different bureaus previously. All of this work was already existing within our various bureaus, but needed a place to come together so that we can better support our connections to Head Start, our community systems development work, and our work in supporting infant and early childhood mental health consultation across each of these different programs and in each of the spaces where children and families interact with DHS services. This bureau will also help to focus on our, our stronger relationships with the different agencies that I mentioned earlier so that we can create a more cohesive early childhood field across the state. So that was the, the sort of fly-by-night version introduction for the Division of Early Childhood. Just wanted to make sure that folks were aware that we do have our very own division within the department. I now want to talk a little bit about some of the federal relief funds that DHS has received over the last year and what we've been doing to get those funds out as urgently as possible to help to stabilize the child care field. And part of the priority in getting these funds out to providers was to help support the child care workforce. This is the driving force behind a lot of these stabilization funds because stabilize, stabilizing the child care field isn't just about helping providers to keep their doors open because we know that providers can keep their doors open when they have staff on board, who they are able to continue to pay, who they're able to support, and who feel like they have a safe place where they can come to work every day. So this is a timeline that shows how DHS has been able to get some of our federal child care relief funds out the door over the last couple of years. This started back in the middle of 2020, back in the fall, um, when, when the pandemic was, you know, much sort of a, in a higher peak with our child care restoration grant. These were initially funded through the CARES Act, one of those first federal relief programs from Congress. We were then able to continue to fund these with CURSA dollars and now with ARPA federal relief funds as well. The child care restoration grant has tapered down over time, but continues to support a little over 6,000 child care providers. This is about 80% of the child care market in Illinois who are receiving these grants. These grants received an extension in 2022. They are set to sunset in June of this year as the other two grant programs that are listed on this slide take more of a center stage for providers in supporting the workforce. The original purpose of the restoration grants was, as you can see on the right, essentially to help stabilize the field, to fill revenue gaps, to cover increased costs as providers saw their class sizes, their group ratios um, being constrained by public health requirements as the pandemic was raging. The idea here was to help provide financial support so that providers could stay afloat. And we've done that with over 820 million. And I think that number might be slightly larger since I, I built this slide in funding going out to providers to help keep their doors open. So those funds are still flowing and INCRA is administering that program on DHS's behalf. Next announced in the fall of last year is the Child Care Workforce Bonus Program. These are $1,100 checks up to $1,100 for each child care worker going out to them through their employer. So these are going out to licensed 
child care centers, licensed child care homes, as well as license exempt centers and homes. There are some eligibility requirements we have to meet per federal guidelines, but we've been able to distribute over $55 million so far to child care workers through their employers, essentially as a recognition of the commitment and the dedication and the work that they have put in over the course of the pandemic as a, a demonstration of, of DHS's and the state's gratitude for their value in the workforce. These have also had an extension. They were set to um, have the application period close a couple of weeks ago. They'll actually be extended through the end of April to ensure that all centers and homes who are eligible can get their application in or so that DHS can send out a check to those that are smaller and license exempt. Finally, introduced last fall as well, DHS rolled out this year our Strengthen and Grow Child Care Grant. These are running through the course of 2022 and are designed as a slightly different grant program that continue to stabilize child care providers, but that also have a stronger emphasis on investing in the workforce. And so while they follow about the same pattern as the restoration grant, these are slightly larger grants to providers and providers are required to invest at least half of these funds in new investments in the workforce. So that could be wage increases, bonuses, investments in benefits or professional development, mental health support, higher education support. Any new investment in the workforce has to be at least 50% of these grants for providers. And so the hope here is that we can use these funds both to continue to support providers, but also to really emphasize the need for investment in the workforce and providing resources to do so. I want to talk a little bit about a related program that DEC is able to fund through these federal relief program through these federal relief funds. And I'm only just going to touch on this lightly because I know that Christy Chadwick will be joining you all later to talk in much more detail about the work that each of the agencies shown here on this slide is doing through the Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity. We're able to fund this through those federal child care relief funds and each of the agencies you see on the screen plays a critical role in ensuring that this consortium is able to get off the ground and, and get to you all at higher education institutions. So I will leave the thunder to, to Christy. I will not steal her thunder to share a little bit more information about the consortium and answer your questions. But I did want to highlight specifically DHS's role in the consortium. We are able to fund higher education navigators at the local and regional level to best support child care workers who may be interested in going back to school, taking advantage of the Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity Scholarship, but need a help and helping hand and connection in figuring out which program is right for them, where their nearest institution is, and how to get connected and apply for financial aid. So we've invested in 36 different positions statewide across the 16 child care resource and referral agencies. And these folks are, are located at that CCRNR level so that they can have have that strong relationship with the child care providers in their service delivery area and help to connect those local child care workers with you all at two-year and four-year institutions, as well as with the scholarship opportunities that are available to them. And the goal here is for a warm handoff from the, that child care worker getting in touch with their CCRNR into the higher education system where they can continue to get supports from you all so that they can be successful in that higher ed program that they choose to, to enroll in. I wanted to share a few other last minute updates um, here just to wrap up as we finish talking about federal relief funds. I did want to mention just to make sure it was clear here that the stabilization grant funds that I talked about previously, specifically the child care workforce bonus and any additional funds that staff might be receiving through the Strengthen and Grow Child Care Grant Program, those will not affect their existing resources that staff might be receiving, whether it's through the Great Start Wage Supplement or the Gateway Scholarship Program, as well as other social services supports like food stamps or other benefits that they might be receiving through DHS, none of those should be affected by these one-time funds or by these short-term funds that staff are receiving through these stabilization programs. And then in addition, I wanted to highlight that DHS received a recommendation from the Professional Development Advisory Council that DEC permanently cover application and processing fees 
policies for gateways credentials. And I want to call out specifically GOECD and the work that GOECD has done through the preschool development grant where they piloted waiving fees for birth to five gateways credentials using those federal relief funds. As many of you may know, these led to a huge jump in gateways credential applications, a 250% increase. And so we are really excited to be able to make this permanent and continue to waive or to eliminate those processing fees for applicants so that they can go on and get those credentials. So I wanted to make sure that I highlighted that as well. And then finally, to wrap up, as if this wasn't enough information, and I'm sure you'll be getting much more in the succeeding presentations as well, if you were looking for more information, we do have a number of our sort of standard reports that are all due to come out this year, some of which have already been released online on the DHS website. This includes the 2021 market rate survey for child care programs. We'll also be releasing our annual child care report here in the next couple of days, as well as the 2021 salary and staffing survey, all of which make up sort of the standard suite of research around the child care field that DHS, DHS puts out every couple of years. And then in addition, we are also now required by our federal government partners to complete a narrow cost analysis. And essentially what this is, is a cost model of the cost of providing both standard licensed child care in Illinois, as well as higher quality child care services. So services that might be in the silver or gold circle of quality range. We'll have this completed and to our federal officers by June 30th, and it will mirror and build on some of the cost models that Illinois has already created, including compensation modeling that's come out of GOECD in the last couple of years, as well as some of the cost modeling done through the Early Childhood Funding Commission. So that'll be coming out closer to the end of June. We will be using this model in tandem with the market rate survey and some information from the salary and staffing survey to help to think through the future of child care reimbursement rate setting in the child care assistance program. So much more to come on that. And the Child Care Advisory Council will play an integral role in thinking through the future of using these reports to shape policy decisions at DHS. And I think that might be all of the information I have for you here this morning, unless there's one last slide I may have missed on the next one. Alrighty, and I'll, I'll include my con uh, contact information in the chat as well. I know I've seen some direct messages about some of our stabilization programs, so I will take a look at those as well, but thank you so much. All right, thanks so much, Bethany. It, it was so great to hear from you and all of the great work that's going on in the newly created uh, Department of Early, the Office of Early Childhood at DHS, so thank you so much. At, at this time, um, we will move into uh, questions with our first uh, three panelists, Dr. Stephanie Bernatite with IBHE, Dr. Jason Helfer at ISBE and uh, Bethany at IDHS. So one of the first questions that we received, I, I will you know, pose that to Stephanie. Where can we receive more information about the cohort completion grants? Thank you, Zach. I'm really excited to share about the great work that is being done by the grant recipients at Quincy University, Joliet Junior College, Western Illinois University, National Lewis University, and Lewis University. First of all, in terms of informal networking, you can definitely connect with those colleagues, Julia Ock, Melissa Simchak, Jenna Kim, Jolly Wen, and Rebecca Pruard in the context of this forum. But more directly, we are looking forward to sharing with everybody a report about their work and looking for an opportunity to have an interactive web session with them as well at an upcoming date. They have really been collectively taking some very interesting approaches to supporting working adults to credential completion, and we're excited to put that out there for everyone. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Some really, really exciting work that's going on with the cohorts. Great. All right, the, the next question, we'll move on to Dr. Helfer. So Dr. Helfer, this question that's being asked is, what is being done to increase the passing rate uh, of the early childhood content test? What is being done to combat this issue? Yeah, so I know that part of the, one of the threads of the consortium work was on the early childhood content test and pass rates, and especially pass rates for individuals of color. And so we are working on that in, in particular. So as all of you know, there's this ever-present tension with educator licensure tests, regardless if they're things like the NTPA, more, I would say, qualitative, although some of you might disagree, 
And then just the content tests, which are, you know, bubble forms, or probably not bubble forms anymore. You probably do them on computer now. Between the public trust, as well as ensure that the exams are not unduly difficult. And so we continually monitor all of our content exams. I believe there's over 40 of them. Our board is very interested in this. Our licensure board is looking at all of the different pass, pass rates and cut score recommendations by panels. Some of you might have done this work in early childhood or other endorsement areas. So in terms of what is being done, we are continuing to monitor, as we always do, and where we are seeing issues if we need to make different recommendations for what's it called the panel recommended cut score, we, we are bringing those to our board. All right, thank you, I, Dr. Hill. Sorry, Zach, just to be very clear, yeah. when we do this, the, the folks that make the recommendations are not his be staff. They are practicing teachers in the particular content area, as well as faculty members in the teacher uh, preparation program. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for providing that thoughtful response. The next question that was asked, Bethany, if, if you wouldn't mind addressing how many centers received funds and how many funds were given and, and what were you seeing and how did that stabilize the field with those funds? So on, on one of the previous slides, I shared a bit of a breakdown across the different grant funds, but in total, DHS has released to date to providers $915,499,346 of federal relief funds. That is direct to providers from 2020 to today across the CARES Act, CURSA, and ARPA funds, all federal congressional relief funds. So a really large investment for comparison that is about the Division of Early Childhood's entire annual budget, give or take a little bit on the, on the smaller side, but $915 million direct to providers. That is about 6,100, a little over 6,100 centers and homes who have received that funding in Illinois. If you include the license exempt home providers who have received bonuses through the Child Care Workforce Bonus, that number doubled to a little over 12,000 child care providers in the state of Illinois. And that's about an 80% reach across the entire market of licensed and license exempt centers and homes in Illinois. For reference, DHS typically only serves a portion of those providers through our child care assistance program certificate-based subsidy system. Of course, all providers can access our quality improvement funds that go through to provide technical assistance at the CCRNR level, but really a wide reach as designed by Congress to get those funds out. As far as impact goes, INCRA called as many any providers that they could possibly get a hold of in the state across licensed providers in 2021 and found that of those who received the child care restoration grant in 2020, 97% were still open and caring for children. That's compared to those who didn't receive those funds. That number was a little bit closer to 75% for that smaller minority who hadn't received those restoration grant funds. So really a huge impact here of this large investment in terms of keeping providers' doors open, keeping them staffed up to the best of their abilities, recognizing that staffing is a huge issue, not only in Illinois, but in other states, and keeping them caring for children. And was there another sub-question to yeah. that, or did I yeah, the, there were two questions that came in, Bethany, and they were relatively similar. So uh, I'm going to kind of combine them here. So uh, kind of uh, building off of what you shared, kind of wondering how, how much funding went towards increasing salaries of child care uh, teaching staff, and is that being tracked or monitored? Was there a requirement that uh, most of it moved to staff salaries? So we've been tracking with INCRA as the administrator here in reporting requirements where providers are spending these funds. And I apologize for not having the exact statistic here this morning, but it's between, I think it was 70, 80% of all of those funds spent out by providers is going directly to personnel, directly to wages to help bolster the workforce in child care providers. So really a huge majority. And that was why we felt comfortable at DHS when designing the Strengthen and Grow child care grant requiring that at least half of this new funding in Strengthen and Grow must go toward new investments in the workforce. So recipients of Strengthen and Grow can still use that other 50% to backfill revenue gaps and ensure that they can make payroll on existing wages, but they must use at least half of these new funds on things like bonuses or wage increases. And the reason we included a broad array of things for workforce investment is we know that some providers were a little bit reticent to 
to put that money directly into wage increases, recognizing that at some point in the near future, we're going to run out of federal relief funds. And many providers didn't want to give a wage increase just to have to take it away um, if we're not able to find another source of revenue for these federal relief funds. So lots of them went into bonuses and the like, but about $150 million of the $300 million investment in Strengthen and Grow is going straight to new investments in the workforce. Really, really great to hear. Thanks so much for sharing sharing that information, Bethany. We have a, a couple of questions left, and they're both for Dr. Helfer at ISB. And uh, you may have to follow up and uh, on these, Dr. Helfer. So you had mentioned IEPP. So how uh, how will that talk to the Gateway Registry? Um, that's a great question. So I will find out, and I'll either send something to you, Zach, or Joni to you as, as I look into it. It might be happening already, and I apologize for not knowing the answer. Perfect. And you know that may be more of a question for Joelle and Inkra, and there's a I believe a session with her tomorrow. So. We could definitely follow up. Thank you. And then the next question, you know, talked about the ISB grant opportunity to increase ESL and bilingual endorsements. Will early childhood teachers, including community-based setting educators, are, are there any thoughts around that? So the last meeting I was in on that was a couple of weeks ago. So a couple of things have happened since then. Um, so if my memory is correct, the data that we were looking at were district programs and the, the disparity of licensure in, in that area. I don't know if CBOs were included, but I will find out and again, get back to you, Zach or Joni, so we can let folks know. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe that concludes our question and answer session. All right. Good morning again, everyone. Really, really just had a really engaging morning with our first three panelists. And to kick us off for our second set of panelists is Dr. Marcus Brown. He is with the Illinois Community College Board, and he serves as the Senior Director for Academic Affairs and Student Services. So we're really excited to have uh, Marcus here and to learn what's going on at the Illinois Community College Board. Marcus? Good morning, everyone. I, I assume everyone can hear me, just a slight head nod there. I just want to say for the record, if you see me put on glasses this morning, mind your business. I've become a man of a certain age. And so every now and then I might have to pull my glasses up just to see what I'm just to see what I'm doing. So I just want to thank you all for having me this morning. I feel like part of my job this morning is just to make sure that I don't repeat all of the things that you have heard this morning. Certainly between agencies, lots of us do lots of work together and lots of work side by side with each other. So sometimes it may seem like a repeat and I will try to not make it uh, seem that way as I begin my comments. I do want to begin though by giving you a little bit of update around sort of ICCB and where we are in, with regard to our board goals. One of the things that I think was important for us to think about is what is how we make meaning of the work that we're doing. And with that, the Community College Board has set across three goals, really which kind of frame the work that we do. And one is around supporting minority, first generation, and low-income students across urban, rural, and suburban communities. One is around supporting seamless transition for students into and through post-secondary education. And then finally, by contributing to economic development, by supporting the system's work, provide robust workforce training, expanded apprenticeships and credential attainment. And as we think about sort of what that means for the work that we're doing and that, in fact, that the agency is doing that we're getting in with the system, I think it really sort of shines a spotlight on making sure that we target how we do our work. So one of the things I want to pull out with the next slide is really kind of this focus focus on equity and what that means really for us, both as an agency and how we are situating our work. So to that end, I'm going to try to keep myself on time, but also to think through a few things sort of in context around the pandemic response and around what that means in terms of early childhood and engaging the system. Uh, and then some, what I like to call connected issues with the work that we're doing, which I think have some potential impact also on the early childhood area, particularly in terms of higher education. But again, part of addressing this equity really means thinking through who we're assisting. So everybody, I think Stephanie alluded to the, the call out in the strategic plan around working with incumbent workers, workers and students who have some college but no degree, really focused on students of color, low income students, first generation students, rural students. But I think as we understand our work, really taking a spotlight on where we know gaps
gaps exist and persist and thinking through how do we do the work that we need to do in order to address those particular issues. So first, I want to talk a little bit about the system's response, at least the community college system's response to COVID-19 and some other things. And certainly, Stephanie talked a lot about some of the other particular initiatives that have happened in the higher ed sector. But I think one of the things that we understand in the higher ed system is that teaching and learning will likely never look like it looked before the pandemic. So I think with all the things we've learned about technology, about online delivery, frankly, about quick shifting, <laughs> you know, I think that we are in many ways emerging as a different kind of system. And so I think it's going to be important that we continue to think about and frame that work, the work that we do around that. With that, I do, and you all get copies of these slides, so nobody panic about where the links are and that kind of thing. But we do provide some ongoing information on the ICCB website around the system response, any sort of emergency declarations or adjustments and rules or any of those kinds of things. So all that's provided on our website. And also, I do want to provide, Stephanie alluded to lots of learning renewal initiatives. And so we I do post for you also the access to the learning renewal resource guide that's sort of overseen by the P20 Council, as well as to highlight some of the other sort of learning renewal and learning recovery initiatives. So certainly we've seen some effort, particularly with GEARS, GEAR funding, and with some other supports around academic supports and understanding how to support students through the pandemic and as we come out of the pandemic. And we've seen that look like everything from embedded tutoring in classes, hotspots, all kinds of access to technology. One of the other things, though, that I think has been really kind of a critical response is really around the social emotional support for students. I don't know anybody who hasn't been impacted by the pandemic or in some ways sort of had some kind of response to it. <laughs> Many of you might be like me. I have four children at home and trying to do remote education with them while trying to work in earnest was not a pleasant experience. You know, so all of us are having all kinds of reactions to that. And, you know, I don't know that there's one thing that makes it magic or more bearable than that for one person to the next person. But I do know that it, it means that we all need continued support to help understand and manage the work that we do or can continue to do as we hopefully move out of the pandemic and sort of emergency responses. Again, Stephanie also mentioned the high impact tutoring project and some work that we're doing around there. So again, given giving you some framework around how the system is responding to the pandemic. And as we continue to talk about some of the other items, I think you'll continue to see some of the other responses as they've been developed. So with that, it's really kind of, for me, an eye toward equity and, and thinking about what does equity look like? You know, where is the learning taking place? Who are we serving now? You know, how are we building these professional experiences? So I think there's lots of framing questions that can kind of help us think about what does that mean as we sort of try to advance, particularly the goal of equity and making sure that we lift up all students as we kind of work through our work. A brief sort of outline about then what that means for us. So I'm going to sort of take a quick dive into sort of the enrollment uh, in the community college system. And so the good news is that these may go really fast. The bad news for Diana is that they may go really fast. <laughs> so just kind of a perspective, in 2020, we had about 472,000 plus students in the community college system with completion rates around 65,000 for those exiting with credentials. As we've kind of taken a look at what's happened with enrollment and sort of subsequently and coming out of the pandemic, we continue to obviously struggle with those decreases and what that means for us in the system. We were excited when we could say, um, in the fall of 2021, we were only down about one and a half percent in fall enrollment for the community college system in Illinois. That's fortunate. I say that we were excited to say that because nas nationally, we were the community college enrollment was down about four and a half percent. So we really were ahead of the curve if, in that regard. And, and I think it's helpful that we were sort of thinking through what does this look like and trying to manage and get students and hold on to students. And we see, again, a small decrease in the spring enrollment this term, but I think it continues to highlight that we've got some work to do and, and some resetting really for students in Illinois about how they access higher education. With that, you know, I, a little bit about the enrollment type and, and how students enroll. So about half of the students in Illinois in the community college system are enrolled in a, what we call a transfer program. And then about another third of those are enrolled in CTE. So you heard Dr. Pierce call out early in the morning talking about sort of this introduction of competency-based thoughts around the career and technical area. And as we think about how that expands and how that has impact, 
impact across the system, there's, I think, some great leverage that we can take from that. But I think the most important thing is that we have to understand that now as students enroll in us, they're enrolling in a variety of mechanisms. So I think that this slide looks this way today, but I think there's the potential that we're going to continue to see a blurring of how students enroll, think about enrolling, and what that means to them uh, in terms of when they enroll. So when we break that down just a little bit more further, you know, we can frame then this conversation about equity and about how students enroll around early childhood education. So I think as I kind of go through these quickly, what we want to do is to have some opportunity to really think through how can we take sort of these big buckets of work that we're working on in the system and make them both meaningful in early childhood education, but also understand how early childhood education can inform the work that we do with some of these other things. And again, still focused on these same populations. I think the same populations that we talked about and from the strategic plan are exactly the folks that we're targeting in, in early childhood education. So I know that I don't want to defer too much to Christy, but I do know that Christy Chadwick is going to talk pretty extensively about the consortium on tomorrow. But one of the things that I think we really do want to call out is that we are working through the consortium. And so it's really designed to create this, the streamline the pathway for students. It's focused on making sure that students can get in, come back to and complete their programs do skill uptake. So whether that means they're moving from a level two to a level three, a level three to a level four, moving from the community college to the baccalaureate system and completing baccalaureate degrees, we really do want to take a focus on making sure that we get students in or return to the education sector and, and then get completed. So I don't want to leave that off. It's beyond just enrolling, but it's we want to make sure that we have a focus on making sure that students can complete, that we make getting through the process easy for them to navigate, that we don't put in undue burdens or barriers for them, and that those that we know have always existed, we move out of the way. And so with that, you know, there's going to, there's lots of work that has taken place that really kind of addresses that. In the next slide, you'll see that we've done some of that work. So with funding from DHS, we've allowed, created a scholarship fund that allows students to be able to access support for them to return to higher education so that there, we aren't creating undue burdens for them to be able to go, that we're maybe, in fact, helping to relieve some of the debt relief that they may have left institutions with. So we really do want to focus on supporting students very directly into getting in, into and returning to early childhood higher education pathways and ultimately into the work, continuing their work in early childhood education. We're looking at processes that help us understand the CDA or the Child Development Associate. We're, we're making sure, as called out in the legislation, that we're clearing the pathway for students who are in the Associate in Applied Science degree in early childhood to be able to transfer seamlessly. That's one of the call outs in the legislation, but it takes some work for us to do that. So we've got some folks working to help us understand and to better lay out the pathway of how that can look as we look across the system. Certainly, we understand that when we think about prior learning assessment, I'm trying to say all the things that I put all the acronyms in on the, on the paper for, but as we think about uh, prior learning assessment, one of the things that we have to think about is, do we have things in administrative rule that, for example, may... Um, prohibit that from being as effective as we want it to be. So we have to, again, continually review what are the policies that we have in place? What are the, the rules that might be in place? And then how do we make sense of that? And then finally, there's an advisory committee, which really does advise the work of the consortium. And that's made up of a variety of folks that are called out in the legislation. But I do want to emphasize that, again, as we talk about joint work, that the advisory committee is co-chaired by all of the state agencies who are involved in the work. So not just ICCB and IBHE, but also the State Board of Ed, the Department of Human Services, and the Governor's Office on Early Childhood Development. It really does require us to work very coherently and seamlessly in terms of our work, both in planning and how we implement that, so that we can continue to both meet the objectives of the legislation, but more importantly, be able to assist students in their process of getting into and through early childhood programs. There are a couple of other things in around the work, and certainly you've heard a lot about those, but one of those is around competency-based technology. Technology. And so, again, as I talked about the shifts in education delivery and how we think about education and what kinds of things will be uh, critical, we know now that we're, we're going to have to think about how does technology fit in to the work that we do and how we deliver educational programs to students. I mean, certainly we're sitting, all sitting here on a Zoom where we used to sit in a room to do this. So we certainly understand that there's a shift that's happened that we have to really acknowledge and think about what does that mean for our work. But I think 
the other thing that it provides us with some opportunity to do is to think about what are those things that are meaningful. So many of uh, the institutions that are on here were involved with Immersion Technology Project that we launched about a year and a half ago um, that really focused on um, preparing students before they move out into the field. So thinking about how do we document those competencies? How do we make sure that students are really ready to move into the field, that they're ready to interact with children, that they're ready to deliver on, on the competency level that we expect that they are when they go out. So this provides us with some framing to do that. One of the other sort of related areas around technology, I think that we can focus on is around scaling efforts, particularly in early childhood, around online courses and sharing and delivery via the Illinois Community College online network. So we really do have the ability to be able to focus on and think about how does that help us deliver our educational programs? How does that help us frame up where we can make better capacity for students, where we can optimize our ability to get the students through programs. So it gives us the, the ability to think through what is that, how do we make better use of the technology we have? How do we maybe bring more students in? How do we support students through programs where we don't maybe have enough, but share together? We can create the space that makes it meaningful for students to be able to still continue through their programs in timely ways. I do want to also mention that one of the other sort of related competency-based technologies that we continue to work through is with the Perkins program. So I know many of the of you are are using Perkins or have the ability to use Perkins programs. So one of the other things that we sort of launched is this idea around making competency-based education more formal in program development. So many of you have thought about what does that mean for us in terms of immersion, not immersion, I'm sorry, in terms of competencies in our program and how we can include those. Can we line that up differently? So as you heard Dr. Pierce talk about sort of modularization kinds of things or other sort of ways to document competencies, this allows institutions to be able to think about what does that mean and how do we put that together in the program that maybe looks a little bit different than we have right now. And then finally, around prior learning assessment, I think we have certainly some legislative mandates that we want to address, but it really means understanding how PLA is used, can be used, and incorporated better into strengthening program completion. So it's not just sort of classically thinking, well, you know, students worked a lot, so, you know, I don't know what to do with that. But it really does help us think about how do we validate the experiences and the learning that students bring to us and make sense of that in programs as we think about how they complete. Quickly, I want to talk about a couple of things that I think are adjacent to early childhood education programs, and particularly where we have some ability to increase our capacity. One is around dual credit access, and certainly we've talked about <laughs> what this means, but I think we have some ability to think through how do we get students interested in early childhood before they leave high school, and then how do we make sure that they don't lose that interest based on you know other things that may influence that decision. So one of the things that I think we want to think about is how students are accessing dual credit what are the ways that we can think about supporting students and supporting faculty who are delivering dual credit in early childhood spaces? I offer a couple of things. On the next slide, you'll see that there's some more detail about the dual credit convening, which we have coming up. And then you'll also see a link on that previous slide about the model programs of study, which calls out early childhood as one of the pathways in, in education. So I think we have a couple of ways that we can think about dual credit and making sure that we grow the opportunities for students to be able to access programs. So again, Again, those regional convenings are coming up around dual credit, and we would encourage you, if you're thinking about how do we even sort of structure that model around early childhood at our institutions or other, you know, structural ways, that that would be one of the ways that I think will help support you. And then uh, one of the things that we want to continue to think about dual credit um, is that we want to, this is a great opportunity for us to think about how we can equitably increase those who are accessing dual credit. What you see on this slide is really the representation in dual credit. The problem with this slide is that this is not representative of how students are enrolled in high school. And so it gives us an opportunity to think about how do we expand access to students who are not already accessing dual credit or how we can invite more in, if you will, to do that. And on the next slide, one of the reasons you see that's important is because the completion outcomes for those who have dual credit are almost twice that of those who don't. And so it really becomes an important sort of carrot, if you will, for us getting students into our programs, thinking about how we help them to complete because it pushes them 
them out in much stronger ways. We also know that this becomes then an equalizer or certainly in terms of access points and equitable completion. So it really does become a critical piece and a critical partner for us to be able to think about how we serve. Finally, the other thing I think I want to call out is really this effort around developmental education reform. On the surface, you think, well, what does DevEd have to do with early childhood education? The thing I think we want to think about in terms of DevEd is that are there things in the developmental education pathway that prevent students from getting to early childhood coursework in the first place? So when we think about prerequisite structures, when we think about how students, what courses students have to take first before they can take other courses, including those in early childhood education, this again can become an equitable issue about who can access early childhood programs and how we think about them being able to get in and complete the program. So uh, we talk a little bit about and institutions all have a, a plan coming up shortly that says this is what you need to do to address the DevEd reform. So on the next slide, you see a, a little bit around DERA being the Developmental Education Reform Act. You see a, a frame up around both specifically what's called out in the legislation, but also what's called out in terms of what we want to understand. So what's your placement policy? Because that can set the framework for how students can enroll in and get into early childhood programs. And then what's the plan, particularly around continuous improvement? And so we want to think about what are the ways that we can continue to support students in ways that are adjacent to early childhood education, but not necessarily sort of specific to early childhood education. So as I think, I'm pretty good, I think I wrapped up pretty well, but as I think about on the next slide, kind of when we think about creating seamless opportunities for students, we want to continue to think about these program goals and decisions. We know that they're driven by local workforce and educational needs. Clearly, there is a need for early childhood educators and support for those programs. But we also think about how do we continue to provide access? How do we sustain interest? How do we expand faculty and staff capacity? Because these become really things that are critical in helping us to continue to expand opportunities for students in early childhood education and to build stronger pathways for transfer, particularly in this program. And then finally, enhancing this capacity allows us to focus on, allows our focus to be student-centered. It allows us to think about what do we need to do to make sure students can get into and through our programs. It allows us to increase our engagement around faculty. And I think things like the funding that's coming to institutions around the consortium will help expand that opportunity for faculty engagements to build in prior learning assessments and other mechanisms for validating learning, which allows us to focus on decreasing increasing gaps in completion across all groups, and really to think about how we can continue to support equitable outcomes for all students and spreading the work out so it's not so single person centered. So with that, I think I've run the gamut of my time, but certainly we'll welcome questions when we get to that point. Thank you so much, Marcus. Really, really great information. Love to see all of the work that's happening at ICCB. Thanks again for providing all of that information. We're going to move, we're going to move next to Dr. Jamila Jordan. I'm really excited to introduce her, not only because she's my boss, but but because she she really has a great information to share with us today. Dr. Jordan uh, serves as the executive director of the Illinois Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development, and she is here to speak with us today. I I will turn it over to you, Dr. Jordan. All right, good morning, good morning, and thank you, uh, Zach, for the, uh, the introduction. So I actually start by saying that Zach is going to, uh, he's doing double duty this morning, so he's actually going to join me as part of this presentation. So on behalf of the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development team, I want to welcome you to this year's Higher Education Forum. I always look forward, you know, to the forum. I uh, also want to extend my thanks to the Higher Education Planning Committee as well as the INCRA team and Julie Lindstrom and Diana. This is Diana's first higher ed forum. So Diana, I thank you. You've met them, but I always have to start by thanking uh, my state partners. We do work closely together. We do a lot of work together. Uh, and so we are, you know, I'm just so grateful for their partnership. And I also want to say to each one of you, thank you so much for, I hope what you have heard from the earlier panel, one common theme is the call out of different institutions and the engagement of faculty that and all of our respective portfolios, the work that has been accomplished to date would not be possible without your partnership. So I want to start by saying thank you so much and again for the opportunity to join you today. So in my time with you, or back, <laughs> our time with you uh, today, we want to focus on, uh, you know, I've talked with you in pre 
previous state panel presentations about the preschool development grant birth to five, as well as the governor's emergency education relief fund. We have quite a few projects in, in these portfolios, but today a lot of our focus is on, is on the workforce and, and you'll see why. You'll see, you know, the connection. And that's why I asked Zach to join me today because Zach serves as the GOECD lead for our workforce portfolio. And so I'll start if we can go to the next slide. And I just want to mention as we're moving forward that acknowledge the, as I always do, the Illinois State Board of Education, who serves as our fiscal agent. And so where we are as far as the preschool development grant, it's we have two main deliverables, of course, in addition to the activities, but part of the funding that's provided by the PDG B5 grant is a strategic plan and a needs assessment. And so we are currently working with the Morton Group, who is working closely with us in developing a, a strategic plan that is reflective of Illinois' mixed delivery system. We have had our kickoff. Some of you have been involved in that work. We're currently in the process of convening our writing group. There is an advisory council. Again, some of you serve on the advisory council for our strategic planning efforts. And again, our goal, uh, once completed, is that it is reflective of our mixed delivery system. This work is informed by a needs assessment. We are completing this needs assessment in collaboration with the American Institutes for Research. They have been, again, just an exceptional partner as we move forward in our work on our our needs assessment. As part of this needs assessment, we have had two projects, the data matrix project, as well as our family needs study. The needs assessment builds on our previous and our original needs assessment, which I've shared in the past, you know, with this community, but we were needing to move forward in building on that work as we began to look across 14 domains as part of this data metric project. We had a number of you were involved in in these discussions as we were looking at data definitions. And I don't think it will come as any surprise. There are many findings from this needs assessment, but I'm, I'm going to share one with you. And I don't think anyone will turn the chair over when you hear that. But across the state, we are inconsistent as far as how we use definitions. And as you think about the implications of that, it impacts our policy decisions, our resource allocations, our eligibility criteria, service tracking, our service delivery, and just overall our data systems. And so as part of this process, we are going to continue this work because we really do need to have precise terminology to ensure that appropriate data is used to improve access and equity within our system. So I just want to share one example with you because you'll say, well, what do you mean about data? Believe it or not, how we talk about vulnerable or historically underserved children. That's surf. A review of the documents as part of the data metrics demonstrated that children and families facing various types of challenges were referred to by multiple terms, such as priority populations, vulnerable populations, and historically underserved populations. And so right there, you can see what the issue is when we think about collecting data, because the, the group membership was not always clear as far as who fell within each of these, these groups. And so we will continue to move forward on our work, you know, with the data metric. The second project was related to our family needs study. And conducting our first needs assessment, it was found that we did not have sufficient recommend, uh, representation of voices of, of parents. And so we had the opportunity to, as part of this needs assessment, and I'm, I'm happy to say that we were able to with the support of our family advisory council as part of the early learning council to speak with over 1,000 parents within the state. And we prioritize some groups, parents of children with special needs, as well as parents of English language uh, learners. And so we're really indebted to those parents that supported us in that work. But just one of the key findings, and I will talk more with you tomorrow about the lessons learned. We've learned a lot from the PDGB5 grant, but one of the main 
major findings is that the navigation, and I was really interested when Dr. Bernatite mentioned as far as, you know, we think about students navigating our higher ed system. What a significant finding from our family needs study is the challenges that families face as far as trying to navigate our early childhood system within the state. And so how do we go about making that system more accessible to our families within the state? And again, I'll talk more about that with you tomorrow. And so at the next area is related to, you heard a lot this morning about the, the GEAR funding, the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund and our early learning uh, renewal efforts. And so GOECD in partnership with, with INCRA as well as DHS are working on a initiative as far as outreach to community and specifically two initiatives, our early childhood enrollment campaign, as well as our Ready for K text platform. So Dr. Brown mentioned Illinois Community College Board that enrollment is down across the community college system, but I'm here to share with you that enrollment is down across Illinois early childhood mixed delivery system as well. And so we are in the process of developing an enrollment campaign in collaboration with INCRA and DHS, an enrollment campaign that is statewide, is tailored locally, that is the funding DHS will support as far as having local and community outreach. It will focus on family and community engagement. And again, our Early Learning Council Family Advisory Committee actually stepped up and stepped in and said, we would like to serve as advisors to this campaign and make sure we get the messaging right. And we're, again, being able to reach families where families obtain their, their information. And so as we think about what parents told us about the enrollment campaign is that they, they really wanted the campaign to have a, a tone that that really speaks to, to being hopeful. We have all gone through a lot, you know, as Dr. Brown has mentioned. I don't think any of us have not been impacted in some way, you know, by the pandemic. But the parents were saying, you know, the enrollment campaign just needs to be hopeful, really just say there's a, a, a way forward. And so I hope at the point that we roll out that campaign that we have addressed that goal. The Ready for K text messaging platform, again, this is a statewide platform. We've had a soft launch of Ready for K as an evidence-based text messaging platform. It's actually a curriculum, and we envision that we will have a minimum of three touches per family per week. It also gives us the ability to customize messages to families, and our goal is to reach 157,000 families within the state. There's multiple languages that are available through Ready for K, and so we are looking to leverage both the enrollment campaign as well as Ready for K. What we heard loud and clear, again, from our, our families, both of these initiatives, is that they view early childhood services as a must-have. However, they are still experiencing a great deal of fear and guilt as a result of the pandemic. They are still apprehensive about putting their children within early childhood system. They also mentioned that they really want to be understood and supported, and they also appreciate the protocols that all of us have put in place. But again, they're still not quite there yet as far as wanting to engage those that are new to the system or to re-engage. And so with these two initiatives, with the support of GEAR funding, we are seeking to address all of those concerns and to gain the trust and regain the trust of our families and our, long, our youngest learners within the state. I'm going to end there because I'll have the opportunity tomorrow to talk with you uh, a little bit more about what we're learning through the PDGB5, but I want to turn it over to to, to Zach to talk with you about our workforce portfolio and where we are as far as the PDGB5 uh, grant. And so Zach, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. All right. So the initiatives we will review today are in partnership with INCRA and IBHE, who have both been stellar partners over the last several years in breaking down barriers for the incumbent early care and education workforce. This is the final year of the PDGB5 grant as it concludes in December of 2022. GOECD and, and vendors have worked hard to maximize the use of these federal dollars on initiatives that will have a last impact in Illinois. On your screen, you see some of the 
some of the initiatives that we are uh, working on during year three. We have the infant toddler credential competency curriculum module implementation, the prior learning assessment initiative, the Illinois director credential competency curriculum module, and then diverse workforce uh, supports for equity. And then the, the next three we will discuss today are the gateways credential fees, the CBE modularization, and the ECE credential completion cohort. All right. So the, the first uh, initiative we'll discuss is the infant toddler course module implementation. So dur during year three, GOECD and INCRA will work together to coordinate with higher education institutions in piloting infant toddler courses based on the Gateway Infant Toddler Competency Curriculum developed in 2021. The online accessibility and opportunities for assessment of prior learning will be included in this pilot. We will work on testing the developed modules. This initiative will also include state and national consultants to provide expert assistance to the project. State consultants have competency curriculum design and implementation experience to assist faculty in classroom and online offerings. We'll also partner with CBIN, the Competency-Based Education Network. They will work on developing and implementing evaluation tools for data collection and analysis. And they will also provide overarching guidance and report findings that uh, include strategies to support and strengthen uh, faculty capacity. The piloting for this initiative will begin in the summer session. Phase one will include College of Lake County, Southwestern Illinois College, Chicago State University, Roosevelt University, and Erickson Institute. Phase two will include National Lewis University, Heartland Community College, and uh, Northern Illinois University. This work includes faculty input from every institution piloting this work, as well as robust student participation feedback. All of the data and feedback will be analyzed and used in the refinement of the modules before being released for statewide use in January or February of 2023. The next initiative we'll discuss is the prior learning assessment with immersion license and implementation. So using the scenarios and assessment developed by higher education faculty from year one, of the prior learning assessment project, the Competency-Based Education Network, CBIN, will use the Develop Virtual Assessment Center as the avenue for assessing the Gateway's ECE Level 2 credential competencies. Faculty who were trained in assessment scoring during the first year of the project are responsible for scoring the performance and making credit determinations for student and, and or the practitioner. Seedman's Assessment Center will send videos from the learner assessments to the learner's corresponding institution. The plan is to release an RFP to transfer administration and management of the Gateway's ECE Level 2 assessment to a yet-to-be-determined Illinois higher education institution by the end of 2022. Seedman designs and develops and scales competency-based education programs. Immersion, if you're not familiar with that, is a leader in the, the immersive learning experiences using artificial intelligence, robotics, and design to create virtual experiences for the practitioner and, and student. INCRA is partnering with you know, national ex experts to review every created scenario using a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens before we begin testing the PLA scenarios. We are developing toolkits for the participants based on faculty feedback, and we will be providing uh, additional training to the faculty from the eight institutions who are partnering in this work. The next initiative is the Gateways Illinois Director Credential Competency Curriculum Modules. I first want to remind all of you that an RFP was, was released for this initiative, and they are due April 22nd. So if you haven't had the opportunity to review that and, and get those in, I encourage you uh, to, to do so. So with this initiative, faculty from Illinois higher education institutions will work collaboratively to build out curriculum into discrete modules using the Gateways Illinois Director Credential Competencies as the basis. Modularizing each competency with corresponding assessments will utilize existing rubrics, de rubrics developed through previous Illinois collaborative work. 
to ensure and expand student access, this modularization will work to incorporate technology. Illinois faculty fellows, previous assessment and technology collaborative work will be used as a guide in the development process. National experts, along with state consultants, will guide the Illinois higher education faculty in collaborative work to create an innovative administrative pathways using the Gateway Illinois Director credential competencies as the foundation. Faculty will develop robust online curriculum that incorporates prior learning assessment opportunities as applicable. Curriculum modules for each competency will utilize existing rubrics developed through previous Illinois collaborative work. The next initiative is the Diverse Workforce Supports for Equity. Uh, in this initiative, GOE, CD, and Inc. will partner together to provide two early childhood career pathway entry points for, Spanish, for the Spanish-speaking workforce to support the Illinois diverse workforce. So two higher education institutions in the state who serve Spanish-speaking students will be a part of this work. INCRA collected survey data in February and March from Illinois institutions about existing supports for Spanish-speaking early child students. Additional information about this opportunity will be shared on or before May 1st with the institutions who currently provide a suite of robust services and supports for our Spanish-speaking students. So with this, we'll embed the online uh, Spanish Gateways ECE credential curriculum modules at each of the institutions to enable broad access by Spanish speaking students. We'll translate into Spanish the 12 curriculum modules that were designed in 2021, and they will be piloted and tested in 2022 that lead to the Gateways ECE credential level two. We'll contract with CBIN to translate the PLA scenarios into Spanish and train faculty assessors who speak Spanish. These online Spanish Gateways ECE credential curriculum modules will provide greater access to the state's highly diverse workforce. Um, and an RFP is currently in, develop, uh, in development, and the survey indicated about 10 inter interested institutions. With the PDGB5 work, we are continuing with the uh, Gateway's credential fee waivers. So this is obviously in partnership with, with INCRA and GOECD. We have waived the cost through PDGB5 funding of the $65 Gateway credential fees. And so this resulted in a major uptick in credentials awarded to the workforce with uh, around 4,000 credentials awarded during 2021. And based on a PDAC recommendation, the Illinois Department of Human Services will begin funding and waiving credential fees beginning July 1st. So that's a very exciting, very exciting initiative there. So we're we're glad to partner with INCRA and IDHS uh, with this work. And, and just, a, just a side note here, INCRA has been awarding credentials on behalf of IDHS since 1999 per administrative code. The next initiative is the CBE modularization. So with this, INCRA is contracting with two faculty consultants for the purposes of managing the online curriculum modules. This will, and the goal will be to correct any broken links in the online modules and to make external sources internal. As I shared earlier, GOECD has had just a positive experience in uh, partnering with vendors to provide innovative pathways to the incumbent workforce. To that end, I would just like to recognize and thank Joni, Stephanie, and Julie, and the rest of the INCRA team who really devote their time and energy to these initiatives. It's just really been a, a great experience. So thank you to uh, INCRA for partnering with us through uh, these, these initiatives. The next uh, initiative I'm going to talk about is the ECE Credential Completion Cohort. You can see the five institutions that are participating on your screen. Joliet Junior College, Lewis University, National Lewis University, Quincy University, and Western Illinois University. GOECD and the Illinois Board of Higher Ed continue their partnership with implementation of five early childhood education and care cohorts. These cohorts target the incumbent early care and education workforce, working to advance their degrees and or credentials. So as you can see there, there's one community college, one uh, public university, three private universities, and these cohorts are serving about 136 candidates. 
who are part of the early care and education workforce. In, in 2020, of the 136 participants, 56, which is about 41%, are, are persons of color. 49 students, about 43%, are attending institutions that serve rural areas. The 2021 report regarding the cohorts is forthcoming, and that will be shared in the GOECD newsletter and placed on the workforce tab when it's ready. So some of the work with the ECE credential completion cohorts, you know, they're designed to support the attainment of the additional credentials along with early childhood career pathways with particular focus on supporting educators and attaining, attaining one or more of the following, moving from a gateways ECE credential level five to a professional educator license, a child development associates credential to a gateways ECE level two, three, or four. Uh, along with the Gateways Infant and Toddler Credential Level 4 or 5 or the Bilingual or ESL endorsement. Part of the cohort design has been to offer innovative, uh, innovative support such as compressed course schedules, prior learning assessment, online coaching, and, and mentoring, just to name a few. And what we found is that retention in these cohorts has been substantially aided by the presence of mentors, coaches and supportive advising, just to name a few. And then I really want to take this time to recognize Dr. Stephanie Bernatite and Michelle Shaver from the Illinois Board of Higher Ed. They have been great partners and have been really dedicated to the work and looking at these cohorts. So I just want to make sure that we recognize them. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zach, for your presentation on our portfolio. So, and again, I just have to say to all of you, thank you so much for your partnership, our state agency partners, as well as our higher ed institutions. This work, again, would not be possible without you. We have our contact information here, so, and then also you'll receive copies of the slides. And so I, I do believe, Zach, I'm probably turning it back over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Jordan. I, I yeah. guess it would be kind of conceited if I said great presentation, but uh, <laughs> because I was yes, we can. <laughs> but, but you, thank you, you did. <laughs> thank you for sharing that information on behalf yeah. of the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development. Well, I thank you, um, <laughs> Yes. Please continue to send your questions in the chat to me. The next panelist is Joni Scritchlow with INCRA. She serves as the senior director there. Joni? All right. Thank you, Zach. I am fully aware that you've got one more uh, set of information before we get to Q&A. And then lunch looms on the other side. I just want to say rest assured, we're going to make sure that you get a full 30 minutes, 40 minutes for lunch. So I, I just had to put that out there. Our theme this year really is leading the way. And I think that the gateways to opportunity credentials and competency timeline, if we could advance a slide deck, certainly show that Illinois is leading the way in moving forward. We're just so excited. The timeline in the Dropbox, and I think it shows so many key points over the last 20 years, two decades of work in early childhood. As Zach just shared, all of these projects ultimately that have been funded by the Governor's Office of Early Childhood Development and other projects and references to funding sources here throughout the morning, at the bottom line, they're focused on providing quality care to Illinois children and families. And we're doing that through supports for our higher education institutions, which provide that rich professional development to our highly diverse early childhood workforce, which helps improve and impact the quality of our early care and education programs. As we move forward here, I know Zach called out our partnering ECE and infant toddler credential institutions and some of the projects that Zach just described. He provided great descriptors and details on a range of projects. And what I wanna kind of do next here is really take a little bit of a different look at this. So these institutions have been innovative and strong partners. And what I want you to do right now, if you're from one of these institutions, could you use the little response button and give yourself a pat on the back or applause or clap or a smiley face because none of this work would be accomplished without faculty at these institutions truly leading the way here in early childhood. So put a little marker on your uh, on the screen right now. We're not in person to applaud you, but I'm saying give yourself a pat on the back. We all applaud you. So hooray and thank you. Um, I thought maybe it's so important to 
when we think about these projects to think about the perspectives of real application. What is it like from a faculty perspective? What is it like from a student perspective? What about some members of our workforce who are students who are utilizing some of the project development that we've been talking about and employers? What do they think? So what you're going to see now is a series of video clips and I'm, we're going to start here sharing her perspectives on the ECE credential competency modules and pilot work in which Northern Illinois University was a key partner. I'd like you to hear from Dr. Melissa Klukas-Walter. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Walter, and I'm an assistant professor of human development and family sciences with an emphasis in child development at Northern Illinois University. We've been honored to have the opportunity to take part in developing and piloting the Gateways ECE modules over the past two years. Throughout the fall 2020 semester, our child development faculty worked collaboratively with the other four institutions to write 66 competency-based online learning modules aligned to the Gateway's early childhood education credentials. This work was time and resource intensive, but also very rewarding as we learn from and with one another, sharing resources, teaching strategies, and assessment ideas. The collaborations across the five institutions deepened even further when it came time to pilot the modules. Each institution developed its own plan for piloting the modules, but the five institutions continued to meet monthly to discuss, debrief, and learn from one another. These monthly meetings were invaluable to the success of the pilot, as well as to my own professional development. NIU piloted the modules in two modalities throughout 2021. We piloted between one to five modules in each of 12 of our existing child development courses during the fall 2021 semester. The modules were included as a required component of those courses and successful completion of the modules counted towards a student's overall grade. Now that the pilot is complete, we're having discussions about how to continue to fund the non-degree seeking credential program, as well as how this fits into the larger Early Childhood Access Consortium for Equity work that is being implemented at NIU and across the state. Overall, this grant project has afforded us the opportunity to critically examine our child development curriculum, including how we can meaningfully assess the gateway's competencies, how we can recognize workforce and other experiences through prior learning assessment, and how we can meet the educational needs of the incumbent workforce. Perhaps most importantly, we were able to develop lasting partnerships with colleagues at other colleges throughout the state and reinforce our collective commitment to the essential work of preparing a high quality early childhood workforce in the state of Illinois. Thank you so much, Melissa. I appreciate that. And then I would like to hear some Dr. Diane Chael. She's a key partner in the infant toddler credential competency collaborative efforts among several institutions that you just again heard Zach speak about that list was shared earlier. Diane is going to be implementing and testing the infant toddler competency curriculum modules this year at College of Lake County. Joining Diane in this video is her dean, Dr. Jeff Stomper, and some of her students. I'd like you to hear what they have to share with us today and listen closely to that last student. This program is a great example of how we can increase access via an additional educational pathway and provide an accelerated track towards earning recognized credentials. It will also help us ensure we have the best teachers guiding young children at a critical time. Faculty at the College of Lake County have found the infant toddler credential pilot very valuable for both themselves and their students. Here are a few quotes that they said about their thoughts on the program. Students learned a great deal about the importance of relationships between the caregiver and the family. The Gateway module with its up-to-date articles and its corresponding real-life scenarios brought the messages home in a practical way. The second faculty member said that building relationships with infants and toddlers is vitally important to their care, and these modules allowed students to collaborate with others and reflect on readings and videos to learn concrete ways to do just this. Another faculty member mentioned that having gateways embedded into classrooms allowed both students and the industry to benefit. Students can gain industry credentials, allowing them to gain employment or higher wages based on these credentials. And the child care industry benefits by having a larger qualified candidate pool to choose from. The program helps upskill the existing pipeline and get the new pipeline of educators ready for 
the future. Many of these modules are even offered through dual credit and the benefits and awareness are felt at the high school level. And finally, the faculty that is teaching our full ITC level two pilot program said that the module has stimulated great conversations in the class on infant and toddler development, encouraged higher level thinking among her students, and, and has provided them with opportunities to grow professionally while interacting with these great resources. As you can see, the faculty at the College of Lake County are having a wonderful time incorporating these modules into their existing and new programs. Um, this project helped me understand preschool toddlers um, and the way they learn by explaining it step by step. Um, it was really simple and easy for me to figure out how to do. Um, the explanation was well in the project, so it helped spread it out so it's not all at once and it made things a lot easier. So with this a module that I'm doing, I find it very helpful because not only am I just learning stuff that I would be, it's almost like doing a class, which I feel is a great learning environment for anyone. Um, I really like how I'm able to go at my own pace because it is any time and I find that with these infant and toddlers, it actually relates to what I'm doing at my preschool and it goes very hand in hand with everything that I'm doing and I'm very excited to be in this class. So I really enjoyed working on it. The last two modules I've done, I really enjoyed it because it really gives me a good example of what I'm going to be doing in the actual classroom when I become a teacher and it just shows like different examples I can use. Thank you and thank you Diane and colleagues at Lake County. We appreciated your sharing. Next, uh, Erickson Institute's work this past year on the infant toddler credential level six, which I think most of you realize is, is graduate level, right? Uh, masters or doctorate. Their work on this has been so rich and incredible as they're moving here now from design into implementation mode. Erickson Institute is moving toward a competency-based education model uh, to better meet the needs of their highly diverse students. So we're just thrilled to share that. Please join me in hearing what Erica Gustafson Dietz has to share about all of the exciting work happening at Erickson. My name is Erica Gustafson Dietz, and I'm a curriculum specialist in the Infancy Specialist Program at the Erickson Institute. Jenny Kemp Birchold and I have the pleasure of representing Erickson in the Gateways Infant Toddler Credential Competency Project. Jenny and I have been excited about the possibility of competency-based education since hearing Dr. Charlotte Long present at the 2019 Forum. We see the work that the state of Illinois is pursuing as an opportunity to drive the development of equitable pathways in higher ed, and as it relates to our work at the graduate level, to meaningfully increase the diversity of leaders in early care and family support work across the state. We're excited about the potential of CBE to address the diverse needs of our students and more broadly the infant and toddler workforce in Illinois. All of the students in our program, like so many others across the state, are working adults who have different learning needs from younger and full-time students. Many of them have their own children or are caretakers for other members of their families. And CBE allows for flexibility that makes it possible for students to attend to their personal and professional needs in addition to their academic responsibilities. CBE values past learning and professional experience, which is a major asset for students in our program who collectively share decades of teaching and care work. Because of our work at the graduate level, Jenny and I authored the majority of the level six modules in the first phase of the ITC credential competency project. And as we got into the work, we stepped back to holistically look at the knowledge, skills, and abilities required of a level six practitioner identified in the 15 competency statements. And what we discovered was that at level six, we're really asking learners to consider strategies and methods for engaging others, particularly families and practitioners, in understanding and implementing best practices for supporting the needs of infants and toddlers in their care. So we considered what tools these learners might need to be successful in supporting practice change of families and practitioners with whom they work. 
And we started with the personal and professional development content models, modules, excuse me, and began integrating theories of practice-based coaching into the learning activities and competency assessments. And throughout the 15 modules, we wove in opportunities for learners to practice coaching and mentoring skills, to be empathic listeners, and to consciously integrate anti-bias practice throughout their work. In addition, of course, to growing their own skills in observation and assessment, data and monitoring, and infant mental health practices. We feel that the result is a really comprehensive set of modules that work independently yet build on each other to increase the confidence and ability of learners that really underscore the necessity of relationships in being an effective leader. In our implementation of the pilot program, we're really excited to have these modules tested by our instructors and students, both to see how the modules impact their professional growth, but also to improve them um, through their feedback in order to best meet the needs of future leaders in infant and toddler programming across our state. Thank you so much, Erica. I think that the perspectives of those who support children and families every day in early care and education settings, uh, they're taking courses, they're out there working, is just so needed. I wonder, I'd ask all of you, how often do you have a student who takes the time to write a heartfelt letter of appreciation for being one of the individuals who got to help test the ECE credential competency-based modules? I would say thank you to Northern for sharing this letter from one of their students. I think workforce members have a lot to share with us about the impact of some of these PDG funded projects. I truly cannot express just how much this coursework has helped me in my job. I am amazed at the opportunities to apply the knowledge I've gained from your program. I've been working in the field for about 18 years and I have enjoyed the professional development hours, but I've learned more from this certification and most importantly, can better serve the kiddos and families in our community. Thank you so much for the opportunity to explore the wide range of valuable research and evidence-based practices on children, families, communities, and cultures. You all have done a fantastic job of putting together meaningful, practical guidance on serving our littlest learners. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, and thanks to all of you who, who developed that work, who did the developing and the testing of it. Um, during that pilot last year in 2021, institutions who embedded this content into coursework, sometimes we had feedback from over 200 students and multiple faculty, probably some of the most tested uh, curriculum modules uh, in the state. It was pretty incredible. The report on this work is in the Dropbox. Please take a look at that. I want you to know all of this work is available to all faculty at all institutions, and we are thrilled with faculty response. We released this on March 1st. Within just the first 30 days, we had like 35 to 40 faculty who were in accessing the module. So I think that's pretty exciting. Then employers who partnered with faculty in scenario development for prior learning assessment we're so excited about the possibilities that this offers to our workforce. Our prior learning partners in the state, all of these institutions were such innovative thought partners in the development of a statewide cohesive model for prior learning assessment. Truly cutting edge work that really uses technology. If you're a member of one of these institutions, can you give yourself a pat on the back or hooray or blow a horn? There's reaction buttons, folks. I'd like to see a whole bunch because look at all these institutions who informed worked on, helped with this work. It's huge. There should be a whole lot of hands going up and hand clapping happening here. Truly cutting edge work. Thank you, all of you. And then I'd like you to hear a little bit here from Lee Eklund. Uh, this was kind of a, a, a great approach that uh, Sieben had suggested, bring in some employers, bring in some center directors, let them uh, be part of designing these scenarios and providing feedback and thinking about really experience-based perspectives for this PLA project. So we're gonna hear from Lee Eklund here in just a minute. And I would have to say, Dr. Lindsay Meeker from Western Illinois University has a wonderful video to share. I, and we're gonna have to put it in the Dropbox. Last night as we were running through all of these videos and clicks, we were having technical challenges and playing it. So you're not going to be able to see that one today, but all of these video clips, in fact, all of the presentations will be placed in the Dropbox next week so you can access. So you're not going to get to hear Dr. Lindsay Meeker today, but please do check out that video clip that will be going in the Dropbox. And let's hear what Lee Eklund has to say here today. He's a center director from Malone Early Learning Center. 
Hi, my name is Lee Eklund from Malone's Early Learning Center in Carterville, Illinois. I was very fortunate and honored to be a part of the virtual training experience this past fall on uh, the avatars in a classroom to be able to have competency testing for people that don't have the college education to be uh, early childhood education level two credential, but have the in-classroom knowledge and experience to be able to earn that early childhood education credential level two. It was very uh, informative, very well done. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this virtual training. A lot of testing has gone into it. And when it rolls out to the general childhood field, I think it will only be a plus and a bonus for a lot of those people that really deserve to have an early learning, early childhood education level two uh, credential. Thank you and everybody have a great day. Thank you, Lee. Find these videos, uh, including the one from Dr. Lindsay Meeker in the Dropbox. Last but not least, I know we've only got three minutes left here. These are the universities with professional educator licensure programs in Illinois who joined in a collaborative effort to create a bridge moving from the ECE credential level five to the PAL. So if you're one of these, if you represent one of these institutions, use one of those reaction buttons. Let us know who you are and recognize you for all of the work that you did. So hooray to these uh, institutions who partnered in the creation of a bridge from the level five to the POW. I'd like you to hear from Dr. Uh, Ann Kenneman at National Newest University, how faculty are embedding and using this work already uh, to support students. They were first out of the gate to start using this. Hi everyone, our faculty at National Lewis University is looking forward to strengthening our program from our work with the G5 to PEL initiative. Our ECE undergraduate program is going to replace traditional content in methods courses, practicum, and student teaching for students in the competency-based approach program. For our ECE MAT, programs, we're going to design content uh, test workshops, embedding the content test resources into our spring term, highlighting the your term activities. And we're going to also embed content in our literacy courses. We have two literacy courses and two math courses from the program from our work as well. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Anne. Just as a reminder here, uh, this, uh, these modules are available to all faculty. So again, the ECE curriculum modules, uh, reach out to Julie Lindstrom, the PAL, the bridge from the Gateways ECE level five to a PAL, reach out to Stephanie Helmer. And there is a report on all of this wonderful work. Uh, there's also a link and it's in your Dropbox. So be sure you take a look at that. Contact uh, Stephanie Helmer if you have any questions on this project or Julie Lindstrom. And if you get to the wrong one, it doesn't matter they'll get you to the other one, okay? Um, finally, I think one other piece to kind of close with here is that you heard perspectives uh, from faculty colleagues who are utilizing some of these tools and resources that were developed from PDG funded initiatives. But I do think there's still that larger question, is this work really being used broadly? Uh, in other words, is it kind of worth the time and effort of development, right? Uh, one tool we have is the use of website analytics, and we're starting to dive a little bit deeper into that. Analytics can tell us how many people have accessed materials, how long they stayed on a page, whether they downloaded things. It's a whole range of data, and we're just starting to put some of that together. And I'm happy to share that on our Gateways uh, website, we noted that the ECE toolbox just the ECE toolbox that faculty access has had over 27,000 hits. So are some of these materials and tools and resources that we're developing being utilized? I would have to say 
Probably yes, because there's certainly somebody in there looking around at the resources that are available. Uh, and from time constraints, they're spending a little bit of time in there. So moving forward, we will keep tracking this and looking at this. We will see which, which resources are more utilized than others. We'd also like to survey faculty about the tools and resources, gain feedback. How can we make uh, changes? How do we make improvements? Uh, what else is needed? So stay tuned for more. And that being said, I just want to close with a thank you for all of the work that all of you have done in leading the way for early childhood. Zach, back to you. All right, thanks, Joni. Really, really great presentation. A few questions have, uh, have came in. And so the, the first one is around prior learning assessment. And I think Dr. Brown and Dr. Jordan, I'll have you both kind of weigh, weigh in on that if you don't mind. So the questions are, are about what are you seeing across the state as far as PLA within community colleges? And then what kind of statewide approaches are happening to PLA in general? Sure. So I think sort of statewide, one of the ways that we're seeing folks think about PLA is really what does that mean? I think while early childhood folks sort of have an imperative legislatively to think about PLA, one of the things that it's prompted is institutions to think more holistically about what PLA looks like on their campuses. And so I think there's been an expansion about how do you situate PLA effectively on campus. So I think there's going to be lessons that we learn from the early childhood space. They're going to extrapolate over into the larger institutional conversation about prior learning assessment and how that's awarded. One of the other things I think that institutions are grappling with is sort of how to position PLA in the larger context of programs. So, you know, the feedback that we've gotten is how much PLA, when and how do you apply PLA? What are the right sort of sets to think about? And also as folks think about sort of thinking through competency-based education and then lining that up with in terms of competencies, I think there's lots of thinking about what does that really look like and how do we make sure that, that we are thinking about PLA, not just sort of in the short term, but also larger implications about program completions and how that can line up across the board. So those are kind of some of the things that I think that we've heard around PLA and how that might be being thought about across the state. Dr. Jordan, do you want to weigh in on anything regarding prior learning assessment? No, just, uh, you know, first of all, uh, I, I think Dr. Brown has really touched on the key points, but I, 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 I want to share again how I'm really encouraged. I think over the last year, I've heard more conversations. I've been in more meetings, had more discussion about prior learning assessment than I can remember in, you know, in prior years. And so I'm just really encouraged as far as where we are going and that this conversation is on the table as we think about supports for our workforce, when we think about access, and when we think about equity. And so I'm just really, you know, encouraged. And I always have to say and acknowledge the fact that Illinois was a recipient of the preschool development grant, which also was very supportive in just being able to raise the visibility and heighten these discussions. So, so thank you for everyone who's participated. Great. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Welcome Brown. Back. Joni, this, this one goes to you. So kind of summarize here, we're, we're so lucky to have the Gateway's competency, but missing a piece is the ability of our institutional advisors to interpret the Gateway's professional development record. So our advising team would greatly benefit from further understanding and the ability to advise students who often bring these records to appointments. Is there a plan to train institutional advisors on interpreting Gateway records? You know, that's a great question. And I'm going to have to say, I don't, I don't think there is, but I think it's a fabulous idea. There certainly is, has been a lot of thoughtful meetings, meetings upon meetings and work to think about what do the navigators need to know and how to access the ISAC website and how do we, you know, uh, because they're the boots on the ground person who's connecting to the center to encourage people to enter into the system. And then we talk about that warm handoff, right, over to the advisors. I haven't heard a lot of discussion about how are we going to train the advisors? So I think that, I don't know who, who typed that in the chat, but you, you should be giving yourself a, a like a pat on the back. I, I think that equivalently 
probably needs to happen. So I wrote that down. I love this idea of thinking about the advisors or advising teams at institutions that uh, have some, likewise, we're providing supports for the navigators. Let's, let's have the same kind of dialogues and conversations with those advising teams at our institutions who advise students and walk through these PDRs. I believe Joellen may also reference tomorrow some changes that'll be made to what we call a learner record. She talked about that at the forum last year, and they've been working hard on that. So I will see also how far advanced that is in terms of being able to share with, again with both our navigators and our PD advisors. But I think there'll be a lot more clarity coming soon on the Gateways Registry Learner Record, which will help everyone in terms of transparency. But thank you for this wonderful idea to think about. Let's do some holistic, offer some opportunities for discussions, dialogue, shared, shared information here with our advisors. I think that's a really wonderful idea. Thank yeah. you. And Joni, if I can add to that, I think that's a great place as we as institutions are implementing the, the funding that they're getting for the consortium work. It would yeah. be a great sort of idea to think about how you can incorporate that kind of training in for the mentor role, the coach and mentor role that's a part of that IGA for institutions. So I think that's another sort of great place to sort of layer that in so that there's someone very specifically charged on the campus that understands that and can work through that with students. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus. All right. Th thank you both. This one's for Dr. Jordan. You talked about the Ready 4K initiative. What are the next steps with the information and data that have been gathered so far? Thank you for the question. We are you know, currently in the soft launch for Ready for K. And so we're not at the point of data collection. We've had approximately 600, if not over 600 families have opted into Ready for K. But I certainly feel, you know, as we move forward, you know, again, as we think about the curriculum, as far as increasing parent-child engagement, I'm hoping, again, that we see an uptick in, in enrollment as a result of in, engaging, you know, families from this virtual platform. And so that's to be determined. So, you know, that's where we are with Ready for K. Perfect. Thank you so much. So uh, also, also, Dr. Jordan, I, I just got another question here referencing the strategic planning that's underway. Can you share any highlights or future anticipated direction for the state, especially from a higher education perspective? I actually hope to talk more about that tomorrow as part of my, you know, lessons learned, but certainly our strategic planning, you know, focus I mentioned earlier would will be representative of our mixed delivery system and so inclusive. We've been very intentional in our engagement with the Morton Group that we're bringing a racial equity social justice framework to the strategic planning process. And so our goal is to ensure that is that it is inclusive and representative of our system. Perfect. We we look forward to that tomorrow. All right. So so this one's for you then, uh, Joni. So related to the idea that college advisors will learn about the professional development record, what will the credential deficits do to students who move away from point? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, we can talk about it. I don't want to get too far in the weeds here. I should have said, no, we need a full hour for lunch. But <laughs> So I'm happy to answer that. You know, all of you, no one better than this group that is here today at the conference understands the fact that the student who actually just starts taking courses and just does chunk, 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 takes courses, semester, 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 graduate, done, is getting to be more and more of an anomaly, actually. that That's not, at, at least from the credential perspectives and what we see here at INCRA, we see students who started taking classes call out on myself and others in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010, right? Notice how we've come across uh, five decades here, right? So when you look at courses uh, that go back pre about 2016, 2017, they don't have competencies called out. They have content area and objectives, you know, that align with existing competencies and things that are within our courses. So, so we're having to look at courses that are taken very recently that have absolutely crystal clear competencies lined out and identified by our institutions and courses that were taken 10 years ago and 15 years ago. And so we're all navigating this language and this time period of, of students don't always have the most 
current coursework. They bring a compilation of courses in. We did shift our language here at Inca a year or two ago to where we really don't talk about points anymore. We really talk about where you need specific content, in what content area, and what competencies you should be focusing on. So we're shifting the language, even knowing as we talk about a content area where someone needs additional education, for example, you need additional education in curriculum and instruction, you know, look, look for some courses that, you know, that would have these particular competencies in them. So we're trying to navigate with the field. There is a lot of older information out there that really exclusively, we operated exclusively with points up until a couple of years ago. Uh, right? Just like our institutions all navigated and moved over to where we could delineate the competencies, you know, within our system. So I want to just say that, you know, we're using competency as that, you know, as our, our language. But if you go back, many of you, when you submitted and became entitled, you know, with using the competencies, the course objectives and competencies and content in a course, it's still cohesive for many of you. For example, again, it's about human growth and development, or it's about families and communities. So we're navigating this piece between points and between competencies. It's not pretty. It's actually kind of messy, but it would be just perfect if we could just say, oh, all students who took courses from this point on, it's pure competencies and students who took courses over here, it's, it's kind of a little bit of an older model, but the reality is we have students who are presenting with a blend of everything, right? And so we're kind of navigating in the messy middle. So I think we are, we're very consistently trying to move toward use the language of competencies. It's crystal clear for students. We know the number of competencies. We know the number of competencies at each level, but our students just don't present to us here at Inker any more than they do at our institutions with just clear recent coursework. A lot of it is a mixture of coursework across the years. So we're working very hard. We put some resources for students and for directors on the website that talk about transitioning, the using competencies as currency, thinking about how the competencies can inform our approach. We're shifting our, again, our professional development record and our learner record over to those languages, but there's just a lot of pieces out there that are still across this work over both the last 20 years that we've done here at Inca with credentials, but again, our workforce, which presents with coursework that goes across years and years and years. So we're shifted and we're shifting and we continue to shift, but as always, there's more to do. And mm -hmm. I uh, I know I had a person who talked to me the other day. They said, I've, I've got this letter here three years ago. I needed to take this and I needed that point. I'm like, okay, should they receive a letter from us today? It wouldn't refer to points, but they still have that piece and I get it. And so we are, our credentials team is very much going back and forth, trying to help explain to people in a way that they best understand and that we can help them secure the education needed to make it to the next level. I hope that answered it. I do think that'd be an important piece to really talk through again with uh, institutional advisors and regators and all those pieces. I think that would be really helpful. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Joni, for such a thorough response. So the next question is for you as well. So we talked about the Gateways ECE Level 2. So the question is, will all of the modules be in Spanish on the site? Are there in then to that question, are there any costs related? There are no costs. Thank you. Thank you to uh, GOECD and those PDG funds, which have allowed this work to be done in a collaborative state way. The work is accessible by all institutions. There is no cost. PDG dollars funding through GOECD is funding the translation of these modules. It will also fund having some Spanish language faculty uh, experts then review after the translation is done, because you sure don't want to go by me looking at something and think, well, I can't even read that. So I'm sure it's translated well. So we will also have a review of people who are very knowledgeable there to take a look at it. And then they'll be posted and they'll be accessible to all, no cost. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I believe looking at the chat, that concludes our questions.